Well, thank you. And uh, I want to thank IFPRI for putting this uh, very important program on. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be with you, and it's wonderful to be with this great panel. To be also with my very good friend, David Beasley, and it's amazing how David is. Uh, he said he didn't know much about hunger, but I've never seen anybody uh, learn so much in 100 days as this man and have as much energy. He's been amazing and remarkable, and I'm very proud of him. When I saw this topic of today's discussion, tackling famine in the 21st century, my first thought was how depressing this topic is in the first place. Um, I was in Ethiopia in the 1980s, and I, was the, I think I was the first official from this country really to go there. I was a member of Congress. I was chairman of the Select Committee on, on Hunger, the, the Subcommittee on International Hunger. I saw 25 children die one morning. And um, I never got over that. I thought that uh, surely we could be motivated to not let this happen again. And I thought the same that during, the, during my trip, uh, 2011 trip to the Dab refugee camp, a time that we saw another famine in Somalia and other parts of East Africa that, would, that led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. And here we are again. Over 20 million people are at risk of starving to death in Africa and the Middle East. And I, like many of you, were thrilled to see nearly $1 billion appropriated. And uh, I was glad to be part of uh, the group to ask some congressmen and senators to appropriate that. And they gave it. Exciting. On the other hand, we have made amazing strides since the early 1980s. Um, hunger has been cut in half. Poverty has been cut in half. I remember 35 years ago, I used to give a speech and I'd say, today, 42,000 people are going to die. And they're going to die of hunger and hunger-related deaths. Now, if I give a speech or if you give a speech, we'll say, today, 21,000 people will die of hunger. That's still a heck of a lot of people. But the fact is, it's, it's less than half of what we used to say 35 or 37 years ago. And it has a lot to do with what's happened from 1984 to today. It has a lot to do with what this panel has already said of programs that they have that we have put in place, safety nets, resilience, roads, cereal production, insurance programs, market programs, these things work. We didn't have these in the 1980s. Matter of fact, you were not allowed in those days to do local purchase. It was illegal. So if we had a, if we had a famine like we did in Ethiopia, in those days, we bought it from our American farmers, we'd ship it over in the ships, it got there three, maybe three months later. And by the time we got our food there, a million people had died. And uh, so a lot of things are different. And that's the good part. And that's what's changed. Um, the other part I want to talk about is on the budget side of things, we have seen proposals coming from the administration that that in my opinion, they go well beyond troubling. Cuts to development assistance for 2018, including elimination of essential programs like Food for Peace, Title II, and the Governor Dole program would be devastating to vulnerable communities around the world. We have had plenty of congressional leaders telling us not to worry. I've spoken to senators and Congress. They say, don't worry. It's not going to happen. Don't believe it for a minute. I was on the Rules Committee when I was in the House of Representatives. It's very easy to shut off all conversation and eliminate and, and say, we can talk about this later, but I'm going to give you one amendment, and that's it, for the whole budget. And I can explain that a little bit later. 
Budgets are moral documents, and budget proposals are statements of our values. And when we see proposals that target programs that help the most vulnerable people in the United States and around the world, this has broad implications beyond policy. Getting back to the famines, I want to praise the tireless work of civil society, including many of the organizations that are in this room for they have all done what they have done for, to bring life-saving relief to many of these populations. Ultimately, we want to prevent famine instead of respond to it. We need to help build up civil society. I know this is tricky when you are looking at where famine conditions are. Um, my own organization, the Alliance to End Hunger, uh, we have worked to build capacity of civil societies in six nations. And we've had great success in some of them, especially in Ghana, where the Hunger Alliance of Ghana has been able to network across the country. They have provided access to much needed services for smallholder farmers. We even helped build a hunger caucus in the national parliament. And we helped them and we and we helped them and we taught them how to raise their own money. This is what we have to do for civil society. Most of these countries they don't have a civil society. When you deal with third world nations, you deal with the government. They need to have civil societies. We don't do enough of this. This is all to say that when it comes to future prevention of famine and the role that US <coughs> government and civil society play, we need to approach food security in a very holistic way that includes democracy and governments. And um, the panel has talked about this in a very real way that what do we do about these four nations? Uh, you know, we, we are making a difference and we have made a difference in the last 35 years how to address famine through resilience and through market programs and through buying locally and, and all the things that we've mentioned. But when you have corruption, when you have bad governments, that's that's another problem. So we got a lot to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.